We supposed to be talking about the case and you talking about me. You, you hit mean? him. But I ain't the one walking around with a dress on, you feel me? So, I mean, oh, nah, we man. going there. You feel me? Well, okay. You feel me? Let's take what you got on. I know. First time I saw that. You've been listening to your 14-year-old aunt talk about she wants bling. What's a man need jewelry for? You What's got on your a finger? Long... What's on your finger? Well, look, my man. Yeah, yeah. That is a wedding ring. It means right, I have Mr. a wife. Mr. It means I, know, I, know. I don't yeah. have any problems. So you are not that tough. Welcome to the Father Stage. I am Jesse Lee Peterson. Thank you so much for being with me. Remember that the Father Stage is now on Locals.com. So click the link in the description to support our work. I am honored to have Judge Joe Brown with me today. He is a former lawyer, judge, and TV personality who is currently running for mayor of Memphis, Tennessee. Judge, welcome to the show. Thank you again for coming on. Judge is in the house. <laughs> That's right. And so um, I have so much I want to ask. First, I, I've been seeing you around for a long time, on you know, your TV shows and in the media for a while. Uh, I want to know, are you a Christian or no? No, I got raised United Methodist. Um, I've sort of drifted away. I haven't heard a preacher talk about sin in 30 years. So <laughs> maybe when I hear somebody talk about that again, I'll pay attention to attendance. That's right. Otherwise, I'm not going in for somebody to have sin jumping around his pulpit and all out in his uh, congregation, and he's saying nothing about it. Do you believe that human beings are in a fallen state? I don't know. I have dealt so much with the worldly manifestations of whatever is going on that I leave those kind of things, those kind of ponderings to those who are supposed to know most about it. <laughs> what in the years uh, that you've I'll been... say this. Uh, my paternal grandfather was with Kojic. He was one of Bishop Mason's first disciples, and he took Kojic to Kansas City from Memphis. I had an uncle who was an elder with Kojic. Both of them are now long gone, and I've got a few other preachers around in the family, so I kind of let them handle that side of things. Yeah, amazing. What have you realized about life? You've been around for a short time now. Uh, according to time, and you've done a lot, you've seen a lot. What have you learned about life that you didn't know until now? How short it was. How short life is? <laughs> yeah. What do you mean no, by no. that? It's an eye blink. Uh, when you're starting out on it, it looks like you've got forever. And when you start getting up into it, you say, wow, that wasn't long at all. So it's all about what you do. Not so much what you say, unless what you say is influential enough to really cause things to happen. It's dangerous being alive on the planet Earth. So how well you meet that danger with courage, bravery, integrity, ethics, morality, sense of purpose and obligation, that's what determines what kind of person you are. Whether somebody will be glad you're gone or somebody will be sad you're gone and whether people will remember you and what for. Yeah. So... Nobody has universal support. Nobody has universal condemnation. So what do you do? Who supports you? Who doesn't? Who are your enemies? Who are your friends? Not so much who you know, but what do you do to cause people to want to know you? That's right. That makes sense. When you are growing up in childhood, teenager, 20s, 30s, and 40s, 
did you have another impression of life or what to expect or what it was going to be like? Did you have another impression of what you have today? No, I basically had the same thing. I had a family that was about duty, honor, obligation, responsibility, and accountability, both sides of it. Um, my maternal grandfather was actually born before the Civil War in 1850, and uh, he became a physician. Matter of fact, he had to leave a few states because he and... Uh, some uncles, they wound up having to murder two deputy sheriffs who, shall we say, participated in or implemented a lynching of another uncle. I have a Choctaw grandmother who used to get on the family and she said, oh, you colored folk, you like to frown. <laughs> said, when we have a grievance, we take a scalp and nail it to the lodgepole and smile. You need to learn how to do that. Another grandfather, as I said, took Kojic back 1896 from Memphis to Kansas City. And it's all been about service. So that did not abate in the generation between those grandparents and... Um, when I grew up and I got it pounded in my head, your obligation is to lead. Your obligation is to be out front when there's danger. You have to be prepared to handle it because it's your responsibility. Right. Absolutely. So you were raised and born in Los Angeles, uh, Southeast L.A., right? No, I wasn't born in L.A. I was born in Washington, D.C., but uh -huh. kindergarten through law school, I was in Los Angeles, and it wasn't East L.A. That was Hispanic. It was in what we once started calling South Central L.A. Oh, yeah. They didn't call it that then, and now you're not supposed to because it's got <laughs> such a bad flavor to it, some people say. Yeah. Amazing. You went to Crenshaw? No, I didn't. Crenshaw hadn't even been built then. Really? Well, I went to, I was supposed to go to manual arts, and then parents got tired of getting broken in. They were trying to do right, so um, wound up going over toward the Crenshaw area, and I went to Dorsey High. Oh, I remember went to John Muir Junior High, and then before that, Bud Long Avenue Elementary School, so... Uh, if you know L.A., you know where they are, so, yeah. Yeah, when I first moved to L.A. in 68 from Alabama, I lived over there um, near Crenshaw on 6th Avenue, and um, I remember seeing the kids coming home from school from Dorsey, and every day they would fight all the way from school to home. There would be fights all the way. And I, I'm like, what? The? I had never seen that before. It was amazing to see it. Either the girls were fighting the girls or the boys were fighting the boys, but they would have fights every day. It was amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You, it got exciting. <laughs> so when you were going to school there, were there fights like that at that time? Well, I can remember one time I came to school, I was in the eighth grade and somebody that had just graduated from the ninth grade and he was going to mantle he came there and he was hung by his neck from the frag pole and his belly had been cut open and the 10 feet between where his body was and the ground his guts were drooping down and we had a lot of violence and stuff going on they had gangs then, Slawsons, Vigdale Vikings, businessmen, Bob Town, De La Soul, and such like. But that disappeared in 1965 when they had the uprising in August. Uh, all of the frustration, aggression, and tension and stress seemed to evaporate, and people started becoming more congenial toward each other and interested in a bigger picture than had been the case. When I was growing up, there were no fights. It wasn't fighting one another. And I went to all black school and 
I remember one time I, me and one guy fought over a baseball bat. It was my time to bat up. He thought it was his time. But then my, my mother, my grandmother and grandparents got on me about that. But there, I didn't see a lot of fights at all until I went up to Indiana. What changed with the blacks to make them fight so much and so much violence? Well, 1965, it dropped way down for an 18-month period between August 1965 and the end of that time period, there were only two black-on-black homicides in L.A. And if I recall correctly, that was uh, two ladies shot the men in their lives uh, because (laughs) they thought they were running around on them. The burglaries dropped to zero. The robberies dropped to zero. The rapes dropped to zero. The assaults dropped down to practically nothing because nobody was mad. But 1968-69, it started going back up because uh, the FBI, LAPD's SIS unit, and other of these alphabet entities were infiltrating the black movement, the Hispanic or Brown Beret movement, Native American movement, and there was a lot of treacherous internal stuff going on, and people started turning against each other, and Johnson didn't run, and a lot of minorities felt there was no longer any hope, and Freaky Dick got in, and things started building back up again. Stressed out, Hollywood was going broke and they got a new crowd in there that was into this thing about we have to deliver a product to an unrepresented uh, unrepresented audience that will eat it up let's go to the lowest dominant denominator and instead of dealing with uplifting stuff they started the black exploitation thing, Black Caesar, Superfly, Foxy Brown, and that kind of stuff. And now I can look at stuff that I see on TV and in the movies uh, that's regular fare, and I get very badly offended by it. And other people, oh, they love it. It was really great, man. Did you check it out? You didn't see so and so, huh? You see, they've become so inured to it over the last half century that they have become perfect victims of the propaganda, and they believe it. So when I studied propaganda at UCLA, amongst other things, one of the signs that you have been successful is when your target starts thinking and talking and speaking and ideating in terms of the propaganda you've been feeding them. Amazing. So we do. Yeah. I wanted to ask, you mentioned that you went to school one day and someone was hanging from a tree, guts hanging out. Oh, from the flagpole out in front of the school. Was that done by other blacks or other races? Other blacks. Other blacks. That's amazing. Was it? Oh, sh- we used to have killings all the time. I think by the time I got... 15 or so, I'd seen 13 or 14 people killed within 15, 25 yards of where I was standing. It was no big deal. People died all the time. Amazing. See, I saw somebody got his gut slashed out with a linoleum knife. I saw five people die by fire when somebody... Uh, torched uh, a nightclub across the street from where I used to live on Normandy. Oh, I've seen people stabbed. I've seen people shot. Baseball bat. I saw somebody done in with a baseball bat. All kinds of things. Wow. So being a young person at the time, were you affected by that in any way? Looked like part of life. Yes, you were affected. It was like being in a war zone. But my old man had been in the war, so 
he got decorated. He came back. He'd tell us stories about it, but not all the stories. I didn't find out some things till later, but it was like, be brave and see the family on the mother's side was from Tennessee. So I'd been down there and I know the dynamic of being back in the 50s and what that was about. I remember before we moved to Los Angeles when I was about five, uh, for a brief time, we were down in Tuskegee, Alabama, where my mother was a librarian with Tuskegee Institute. And I remember we were coming from Tuskegee Institute back to Jackson, Tennessee, where our people lived. And I know we uh, crossed through a suburb that was one of these sundown towns type things. And she handed me her Coca-Cola. She loved these things, uh, one of the small bottles, and she wanted to fish in the glove compartment. And I put the bottle on my knee. I'm sitting in the back seat. And three shots were fired at the car we were in. I guess the shooters were trying to shoot the old man who was driving, but they didn't properly lead. So one bullet went through the left rear passenger door and it shattered the bottle of coke on my knee i was worried that my mother was going to pitch a fit but <laughs> she was cool she just said baby lie down on the floor but i said are they shooting at us because <laughs> in those days a whole lot of black folk had been in the war and they tell stories about that we'd hang on every word yeah so i kept wanting to look because it was exciting to me and uh, she was cool. We had to repair the car. There were three bullet holes in it, but I mean, that was a reality. Amazing. Wow. I, or I, 1968. Let's fast forward. I've grown. I was in my 20s. And um, I was working with the university. So myself and two other guys we were running an errand for a professor. We had to go out to Anaheim. We couldn't find a place. And it turned out to be two blocks from Disneyland's parking lot. Cop pulled us over, said, are you trying to find something? I said, yes, sir. He said, well, gentlemen. He said, uh, I understand why you can't find it because it's in an alley and the alley's not really marked. And he gave us good instructions and he said now it's winter so they're about 35 minutes of daylight i'd strongly urge you to complete your errand because when it turns dark you're not going to be sir you're going to be nigger do you understand what i'm saying <laughs> So get out of here. And Inglewood, which is the place to be, you didn't go through Inglewood back then unless maybe you had a written pass from somebody you worked for as a domestic or you worked in their business. That was just not a place for black folk to be in after dark. That's amazing. So amazing changes. And that was California. Let's not get into Tennessee and Mississippi and Alabama and Georgia. So do you believe things are worse now or better? Uh, it's not a matter of belief, but my opinion is that they're a lot better. It's what upsets people is more psychological now than it is physical, lethal. The police are Boy Scouts these days. I've seen LAPD give you an example. I was just in law school. Um, we had uh, a certain professor that liked to do pro bono work for criminal cases, so we were helping him with his investigation. And we were out by Santa Monica and we're talking to the witnesses and we're on a front porch. Some guy came up proud. He just got in the uh, Oldsmobile 882, brand new, just left the lot. And he parked it out front and he was bragging about it. 
Somebody drunk came along, sideswiped six or seven cars, including his, and then crashed into a phone pole, got out, staggered around, and fell unconscious across the crumpled up hood. Well, we called the police. Nobody showed up. Half hour, 45 minutes, an hour, and finally several of the residents called, and they got a sergeant out there. And just as he arrived, two uniform patrol type arrived. So they said they had better things to do than to worry about somebody who was drunk driving. Well, look, he's getting ready to get up over there. The sergeant said, I said, we have better things to do. And the guy whose car got hit was pretty upset. So the sergeant said, you want something to get upset about? I'll show you. He pulled out his four inch K frame Smith, the 38 rammed it into the guy's left shoulder and shot him. Said, now you got something to worry about. <laughs> he said, come on guys. And they went and left and we had to get him to the emergency room. And when the law professor, um, we law students went down to help out. They have a book that had all the pictures of the people assigned to the precinct. And they had three pictures that were obviously removed. And, well, you guys can't seem to find anyone who matches the description or that you can recall. <laughs> Certainly that means nobody in this precinct was involved. Speaking of law school, they used to hate this one professor, not the one we were working for there, but another one. So LAPD would come drive up and they'd park next to his car at a meter. The meters would only go for one hour within a mile radius of campus. So as soon as it ran out, they would drive over to the law school, march in and arrest him for parking tickets. See, in California at the time, that was an infraction that you could be arrested for, even though it was only a $2 parking ticket. So several times they'd get him and we'd all go down with another few professors and they'd say, Oh my God, certainly we wouldn't do that. We couldn't have him in there. And anyway, we get 48 hours before we have to charge anybody. So the law professor would be in there for 48 hours and heaven help you. If you got busted <laughs> on a Thursday or Friday, you'd spend the whole yeah. weekend in there. Amazing. So, I mean, this is LAPD. This was crazy. It sounded like a movie. It sounded like... Yeah, it, in fact, movies. You ever seen L.A. Confidential or Mulholland Drive? Both of them have this thing in there, which was a true incident. LAPD detectives marched into City Hall, went up to the 17th floor where the D.A. had his office. This is the elected D.A. They didn't like something he had done, so they grabbed him, opened up the window, 17 floors above the ground and hung him out by his heels and threatened to drop him. Amazing. He didn't do what they wanted. So LAPD <laughs> ran LA instead of, they ran City Hall instead of the way around. It used to be rough. Wow. <laughs> I mean, that's just LA. It in uh, the South, you didn't travel in the daytime. You'd sleep at a colored motel or you'd look at this green book that uh, they called it, that Sinclair Oil came out, and they'd have a list with phone numbers and addresses of places where colored and other minorities could stay during the day. So you travel at night on these little two-lane dangerous roads, and your lights weren't like they are now. And if you couldn't find any place to stay, you'd stop and ask some of the field hands where it was safe to pull into some woods. And they'd tell you, and you'd pull up next to a stream, and you'd sleep during the day and travel at night. Otherwise, you could come out when you got within 30 miles of home. As soon as you got out, it was daytime. All right, boy, what you doing here? <laughs> well, we're going to visit kinfolk. Well, who are you going to visit? Well, we're going to see Mary Wallach, Aunt Mary. You know Mary Wallach and Biz Wallach, them show people. Okay, well, i tell you what. That, uh, 
trooper, Jackson, gonna pull you over by three, four miles up here. We don't like no strange colored in the neighborhood, but you just tell them you spoke to trooper Johnson uh, or Thomas, uh, whatever, and you tell him you're gonna see the Wallace. You be all right, boy. Now, go on, don't cause no trouble while you're here. You hear what I'm saying? <laughs> what the? So there's so much I want to talk to you about in time going by. How did you manage to survive all that? God taught that maybe you wouldn't. But if you didn't, make sure you went out for the right purposes. So be brave and courageous. Never back down from a fight. If you had to make a strategic retreat, then you did that. But come back later and do payback. So that's how I got raised. So it's kind of been the life mission. You know, that's amazing. Do the right thing. And so did you grow in fear? Were you a fear that something may happen or no fear? Well, it was not that you didn't have a healthy fear of potential harm. Where I grew up, you didn't just walk around the corner. You looked around the corner carefully <laughs> to see if the wrong people were on the street. Then you went down that way. When you went home from school, you got with your homeboys and uh, you we're going out to Southeast Gate. Everybody meet up over there so you could, wouldn't go out the wrong gate. Because when I was in junior high slash middle school, we didn't call it middle school then. Right. Uh, yeah. It was, they had a lot of street gang activity. Got to Dorsey High, it wasn't as bad. Though if you saw this movie, Boys in the Hood, that was 25, almost 30 years after the fact, but that was kind of the reality. You just did not lie did I walk out. You tried to keep a situational awareness because it wasn't safe not to. Amazing. Um, I read that you were a uh, Democrat at one time. And then you decided not to, you left the Democratic Party. And did you become a Republican as far as voting an or independent. independent? Independent. Independent. And why did, you uh, leave, why did you become a Democrat and why did you leave? Black folk were not Democrats. The Democrats were the enemy. That was the Klan. That was the sheriff that pulled you over. That was the highway patrolman that wanted to know what you were doing, but tell Trooper Jackson that you talked to Trooper Johnson and, you know, it'd be all right. It was racist, Strom Thurmond and Eastland and Stennis and Faubus, by the way, all of whom supported Joe Biden, and I heard them introduce him during a particularly unpleasant little episode. I heard him making an early campaign speech, 1972, outside of the state capitol in Dover, Delaware. Um, those clowns were very unsavory. Now, the Democrats had economic policies that I approved of, and a lot of what was going on in my world was centered around, do you or do you not get drafted and sent to Vietnam? Or if you got a ROTC thing, are you going to survive where they send you, or do you get a deferment to pursue a postgraduate degree type thing? Right. I didn't like Republicans because they had St. Ron the Ray Gun, and he ruined public education in California. For example, when I went to UCLA, there was no tuition. There was no tuition for the state college system or the city's uh, colleges. They had an incidental fee, which at UCLA was $56 a quarter, and that got you free medical care, free dental care, free prescriptions, free eyeglasses, concert tickets, all of the entertainments, all of the athletic stuff, and financed a lot of stuff going on around the school, but it was not tuition. So from $56 a quarter, this clown jumped it up to $840 a quarter, which was like 
uh, that'd be like 60 some thousand a year now. So it was just absolutely obscene. He was campaigning on the plank that no one needed a higher education. You could do without it. And if you got it, you were likely to be a long haired hippie who was a comedy loving sympathizer, et cetera. And you saw all kinds of <laughs> far right nasty tricks. And then there was that clown J. Edgar with the FBI, who turns out to be a black man trying to pass for white. J. Edgar Hoover was a white was a black man? Yeah. Oh. I didn't well, know that. Yeah. What the oh. Look, 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 look. I'll do this. Let, since we're talking, I'll let you see a picture of him. Now, who is this? <laughs> wow. That's J. Edgar Hoover. Really? As a young man. Well, he definitely looked like a black guy there, but I never knew yeah, that. Yeah, and the Smithsonian Channel and the History Channel have done features over the last several years about his hatred for the Klan and what he was because the Klan ran his family out of Louisiana because they were trying to pass for white. So it's what interesting the? what we do to ourselves. So Was it commonly known that he was black? Some of us knew it, and it's sort of like the worst somebody you can have is somebody who hates his own people because he doesn't want to be reminded that those are his people. He was also gay at a time when that just wasn't happening. His lover, Colson, was the deputy director of the FBI, so they did a lot of nasty stuff. I know when I was undergrad at UCLA, Every time we would do something political or anything, which was all the time, you'd be hauled in within two or three weeks and taken downtown L.A. by and questioned and interrogated by the FBI. What did you say? I have a First Amendment right to say what I felt like saying. What about? Did you there? I have a First Amendment right. I decline to make any statement. By the way, if you're talking to the FBI or federal agency, Never say, I don't know anything about, I don't know what you're talking about. It. Don't say that because they usually tell you what they have you in there for. So uh, they will prosecute you for harassment purposes. And I know later I'd have clients and they'd have 17, 18, 19, 63 counts of an indictment. I'd beat all of them except one, and that was making a knowingly false statement to a federal official or agency. And why was it? Because they record you getting told, we have you in here because you're trying to sit there and deal with uh, violence in the community or you are pushing this. And if you say, I don't know anything about it, well, it has told you what was uh, what it was about, so they'd get a conviction on that. What a mess. And somebody would get a 60 month sentence and they'd wind up serving 56 to 58 in federal custody on that. And then the rest of it is an acquittal. They did it all the time. You can also thank Joe Biden for that with him, Eastland, Stennis, and Byrd back in the late 70s and in 1981. So we have. Uh, a change now where we have things that we blame and we like to use that as an excuse. But as I'm fond of saying, like right now I'm in a dining area in my house and I'm looking at the kitchen, there's no white supremacist sitting on the other side of the breakfast table or the dinner table or the dining table or the dinner table to interfere with a child doing homework at that table and a parent trying to teach the child what he needs to be taught and learning in the process. You get kindergarten through 12th grade down and the rest of your life has open doors. Now, you may have to kick them all the way in, but at least they're unlocked. Yeah. So 
a lot of what we do, we bring on ourselves. And I had great hope for the future back in the late 60s, but it kind of evaporated. And I'm rather disappointed in how badly we are doing harm to ourselves these yeah. days. And our main problem is not the kind of killing that used to happen. That was at least related to gang activity or hostilities. Now we see, yo, man, it's all about pimping, man. Now, why you'd want to be a pimp, I don't know. <laughs> right. And I used to represent a bunch of them 40-some years ago. It was their defense counsel and a lower bunch of scum you cannot find than pimps. And people ideate on the wrong kinds of things and man's but. Uh, what your women doing for you, man? Like, I got four ladies take good care of me. Two of them got good J-O-Bs. One get a crazy check. The other one get AFDC. They takes care of me. Like, what do you do? See, yeah. that whole emasculation thing is something that was not there 55, 60, 50 years ago, 45 yeah. years ago. It's new. And Black people and other minorities become the tip of the spear for what I think is this reason. See, if somebody wants to go rainbow, they now have a new ethnic group that's not black, not Hispanic, not Asian, not uh, Native American. So they can become this rainbow. Now, you are into the religious thing, and I'm going to offer this to you. The biggest threat you have right now is a new religion. It's called the rainbow religion. And if you don't understand why it's a religion, consider that we do have Christianity, Islam, Judaism. We've got uh, Hinduism. We've got Buddhism, etc. But Buddhism does not have a deity. It's a system of philosophy. LGBTQIA plus is a system of philosophy. And there are a number of its followers who have insinuated themselves into government, entertainment, news, and the communications industry. And they are zealots and they're trying to impose their new religion on the public. You can't have a Christian symbol under an American flag from a government building. You can't have an Islamic crescent. You can't have the multi-pointed Jewish star. You can't have a symbol of Buddha. You can't have a Hindu symbol. But you can have hanging under a flag in Washington, D.C., on a federal building, on a lot of state capitals, you can have the White House or the Capitol building or on the consulate or an embassy. They have the flag of this new religion, the rainbow religion. Yeah. Now, I'm not down in gays, bisexuals or lesbians because a lot of them look at this thing as a cult and they detest it. As yeah. one explained it to me, just because you are a Christian does not mean you supported Reverend Jim Jones and drinking Kool-Aid <laughs> yeah. at large church picnics in Guyana. And if you're a Muslim, that does not mean you support Al-Qaeda or ISIS. Yeah, good so, point. Yeah. I want to ask, why do you think people like Al Sharpton and others support this new religion? Because you're right about he's that. A pimp. I'm sorry? Sharpton the pimp. <laughs> He's spent. He used to be James Brown's publicist and some other things too. That's why he always wore his hair gas, like he was trying to be put in the early modern American history wing at a Smithsonian institution. And have you seen his apparent facelift these days? Apparently, he and Joe Biden have the same plastic surgeon crew because they're beginning to look quite similar with the work done on them. <laughs> it's like, come on now. Amazing. But I don't like him because he's always trying to dramatize opportunities for selfish reasons. 
See, that's one thing that happened 50 some years ago that was a poison that we still have not extirpated from our circumstances. This movement, this unity, allowed certain hustlers, pimps, near do wells, snitches, informants, and other stuff to be recruited and get an opportunity to advance at everybody else's expense. Yeah. So folks say, we need to be unified and we all need to get together. No, sir. Right. We don't right now until we weed out the folk that need to be weeded out because they'll slit your throat when you are backstab you when you're not looking. Yeah, that's amazing. I, um, I wanted to ask... So you, you became an independent because of uh, the... the I, I just got sick of this thing of attempting to emasculate the country. Yeah. That's when it really got bad. And also a thing about gun control. It's been my experience that if somebody's violent, that's a character issue. It has nothing to do with the weapon. And the thing about gun control is that if you expect a crook to follow the law and he's bent on murdering somebody and getting life or life without parole or the death penalty or risking it, he's not going to refrain from using a uh, weapon because you tack a few more years on it. And the weaponry that I am very familiar with because here in Shelby County, they had a record that would pile up this high on all of the guns that were confiscated in the county and where they came from when you trace them. The real hardware doesn't get sold at a gun store or gun show. It comes in in crates with the kilos of drugs that the war on drugs can't stop. And the U.S. government is complicit in that. Amazing. To raise money to fight international terrorism and before that communism, a blind eye was turned on the shipment of American military arms that had been uh, distributed in South America that came in with the cocaine. From Israel, there was a blind eye turned to the Kalishnikov-type weapons seized during the Arab-Israeli wars that came in with the opiates that came from, from Israel to fight terrorists, uh, ISIS and Al-Qaeda, and Arabic interests back in the early 70s. It comes in from Afghanistan and Iraq with Kalishnikov stuff and opiates there, and it comes in from South Korea because they now have their own indigenous industry. It's called Daewoo, D-A-E-W-O-O, and they make their own weapons, so they are getting rid of the American weapons that we donated to their cause, along with opiates. And again, this is supposed to be for black ops so they can raise money to fight international terrorism. And we have a steady supply of arms coming into the country along with drugs. You get things like this uh, Chicago situation where a few years ago these boxcars in the IC railroad yard got looted and thousands of military-grade weapons were stolen. And they are now in distribution. And Mayor Lightfoot at the time in Chicago in a very ill-advised fashion uh, gave a lot of money to street gangs without realizing it, so they were able to finance that operation. So now, all over the country, weapons turn up that were taken from those boxcars. You get 18 wheelers hijacked on a regular basis that have shipments of arms to rearm, say, a sheriff's department in Alabama, along with a police department in Alabama, and maybe a new supply for new recruits to the state police. So you get weapons hijacked that way, and you get them in circulation. So you're not going to get the bad guys out of the way with their stuff, because yeah. now the new trend is everybody gets turned out on the street five or six times 
with pending charges and no bonds set on them. They're just released and they cycle through. And you have this woke thing that is poisonous. Now, last month, well, actually, the beginning of this month, I was in uh, Minneapolis, uh, Minnesota. We're on some business, and myself and business associates, we went over to the cupcake shop where George Floyd met his demise. And we had a two and a half hour conversation with some of the community locals, and they were telling us how evil the BLM program has turned out for us, how badly this woke thing has turned out for, well, for them. They said they got police defunding, but it's so bad now that they had 10 or 12 shootings just in the last well, the next few weeks after the George Floyd things, because they pulled the police out. Uh, they said you could hear women screaming at night as they got raped and there was no police presence. Uh, somebody gets hurt, has a heart attack, the ambulances won't even come. They've had to form ambulance uh, stretcher parties so they can carry the uh, injured people or suffering people to the periphery where the police will come and then bring in a, an emergency vehicle 911. Said the people are getting held up and everything, so they had to implement their own uh, community security. And they spent a lot of time and they wound up getting funded. Guess how they got funded? They had to intervene to keep the BLM types from burning down neighborhoods in Minneapolis uh, so the police could wind up handling the scene in the more civilized portions of the town. See, wow. that's how crazy some of this stuff gets. It's ineffective, and it's about character. These boys are not getting masculine training, yes. and they become violent, out of control when they don't. So you have to put this back in, but the Democratic Party is trying to snatch everything masculine out. Yeah. Uh, they're saying we need to focus on female employment. Well, in Memphis, 58% of the workforce is female. Whoa. That means only 42% of the people working here are male. And when the majority of the males are unemployed, you got a mess. You see, what's going on? What a Girls mess. aren't doing drive-bys, it's the boys. Yeah. Now, nationally, this is the thing that the Democrats have come up with. For the last 20 years, only 28% of each year's high school graduates, on average, are male. Only 32% of the college undergraduates are male. Only 36% of the college grad students are male. And only 44% of the American workforce is male. You've had 50 years of take your daughter to work week, but not one single day of take your son to work. You have all of the programs for the girls and not one for the boys. And the boys are still doing the drive-bys, not the girls, though we do have the rise of what I call girl realtors where somebody has failed to teach these young ladies how to be ladies and yeah. to be respectful. And they're brawling, they're fighting, they're doing gang activity, worse than I've ever seen. Now, that's what I see as bad, is the girl Rilla phenomenon. I've never seen girls, women, fight like this right. as often and frequently yeah. as I have seen them now. Now, Amazing. we have to do something about putting decency together. And since you have the religious connection, please tell some of these pastors to start preaching sermons about acting like you've got some sense, <laughs> acting like you have decency. That's and right. your objective is not to tell young ladies they have complete license to act in a licentious fashion and go around naked like Lizzo. They need to put some clothes on and act like they're ladies. That's right. So they need to be mothers. And Amazing. it's like when I hear people say what guys can do, I'm not turned on by hearing somebody say, oh, the guys have an opportunity to be interior decorators and fashion <laughs> designers. What's that do? Yeah. So then we turn around and we get this thing where it's taught to the young women that 
being a mother somehow or another is uh, demeaning. And then we get this trans crowd that seems to have co-opted so much saying they're just egg producers and, you know, birthers and, you know, and all of the negation of motherhood. That is not a good thing. That's not healthy for the human race. You're right. I got to ask, and I need to move a little faster here. I'm getting the signal. Time is running out. Were you for, where did you stand when they were doing this defund the, the police thing? Where were you on that? The police need to be brought under control and put under civilian management and direction. But no, I'm not for defunding police because there is a certain type of systemic danger out there right now that is getting fostered and produces the thing that I was telling you about. Yeah in Minneapolis, in the area where Floyd died, and they took the police out. It just doesn't work. So actually, we probably need more money, but we need civilian control of the police like you have with the military. Absolutely. What, uh, what's your opinion on uh, what's happening with the Great White Hope, Donald Trump, right now? You have a right to remain silent. Anything you say can and may be used, et cetera, et cetera. We know those as the Miranda rights. Miranda was not a nice person. But when you have law, a lot of times some of the most sacred principles are established through the ages or the agency of somebody that's not nice. Now, if you're worried about downing Trump, you lose track of the fact that what you see, the indictments in New York, uh, Florida, and Georgia are completely outside of the law. Take what this clown brag did in New York. Whether you like Trump or not, essentially what they did is indicted him for being the victim of a blackmail attempt. They said he attempted to bribe Stormy Daniels to remain silent. This guy didn't go to law school and didn't pay much attention when he was there because when you flip the script as you are instructed first year, if you had to pay somebody to be quiet, you got blackmailed. So he's the victim of a felony. If you indict a corporation for failure to file an explicit report as to what the payout was, well, there was a court gag order. And if they filed the explicit report, they violated the court gag order. Okay. Get to Georgia. I won't belabor all of the accounts, but I downloaded the 92-page indictment, and I was shocked to find that some of the crimes were that Trump is supposed to have advocated checking out Newsmax, Fox News, and some other conservative religious-based news institutions they're legal hell i read them (laughs) so that's supposed to be somehow or another criminal now all right you get down to this thing in florida and they're talking about the documents well let's forget what trump did let's go back when he was not president of the united states and george herbert walker bush was There is a case from 1988, U.S. Supreme Court. It's called United States Department of Navy versus Egan, E-G-A-N. And if you read the uh, concurring opinions, they say since constitutionally the president is the commander in chief of the military and chief diplomat of the country, he has an inherent power to declassify or classify anything, any document, in any form, shape, or fashion he chooses. He can do what he wants with it because, guess what? The mandate that causes it to be prepared says it is for the exclusive purpose of advising the president on the state of our intelligence versus what's going on in the world. So he also has a fiduciary responsibility, it's been held, that you do Once you take that oath, whether you are in office or not, it still binds you and you have to make an assessment on whether archivists have appropriate security clearances. And also the other thing goes to this. Uh, 
even if Congress comes up with a law that says he can't, well, that's unconstitutional. And Marbury versus Madison, 1803, 220 years ago, says if Congress passes an unconstitutional act, it is null and void. And that's what seems to be the case here. So you keep going into it and you find something that is very disturbing. Individuals belonging to a party are going to do the equivalent of a child in elementary school throwing something at another child and then running to the teacher and saying, teacher, teacher, he's going to hit me. You just wait until you go, my mommy picks me up. You won't be able to catch me. Nah, nah, nah. <laughs> See, that's what it looks yeah. like. And the yeah. idea that three individuals are going to, or three little entities are going to deprive the American public of who they want to vote for is absolutely disturbing. Let's say it looks like the National Socialist Workers Party. Yeah. Now, if you're not familiar with that, the acronym for National Socialist Workers Party is Nazi, N-A-Z-I. And we remember Adolf and Heinrich and all those guys. Maybe. And let me what ask, happened? <coughs> let me ask this. Do you think they're going to put him in prison? Uh, there's no way this should stand on appeal. What they want to do is take allowance of what Biden and Spanish and Byrd introduced 40 years ago is legislation that allows a U.S. attorney for the specific purpose of crippling someone, bringing criminal charges, even if there's no chance of making them stick. This is what I said was happening when they started the prosecution of Dr. Bill Cosby. I said, this is so far on the wrong side of the Fifth Amendment, there's no way it would stand. Now, I've talked to Dr. Cosby personally several times since he got out, and they offered him immediately, we'll let you out two or three days if you'll just go along and concede. No way. He wouldn't. And the bottom line is, you can't violate the Fifth Amendment by saying one DA says we're not going to prosecute. Okay, so now he doesn't have any protection against being required in a civil matter to answer interrogatories. And then another DA coming in and saying, we're not bound by that. We're going to take his interrogatories and use them as basis for our prosecution. He never admitted wrong. All he was doing was saying, hey, it was sex, drugs and rock and roll, yeah. sex revolution. When all this was going on, they got what they wanted. I didn't take advantage of them. But you see. Those were constitutional principles that are more important than anyone's grievance because they impact all of us. That's what's scary about this whole thing. Amazing. Um, short answer. What is the solution to all this mess? Home training. But since we don't have home training, we have to get back to where we were 40 years ago, 45, 50, 60 years ago, which is churches, synagogues, mosques temples, the public, the movies, the entertainment industry, the people start talking about character, making where you live a better, safer, more secure place filled with economic prosperity, sense of purpose, etc. Being brave and courageous, men and women of public peace, dignity, order, otherwise, where it's up to us to do this, nobody's going to do it for us. Yes. I got to put you on the hot seat, so I need you to answer these questions as quickly as possible. The hot seat. What is a man? Man is a masculine creature that has decided he's going to deal with the masculine compact of duty, honor, obligation, responsibility, and accountability. He's brave and courageous, and he imposes public peace, dignity, and order. Being a man is a title that's earned. It's not the same as male. Is it wrong for a black man to love the Confederate flag? Hey, you think what you want to think. Depends upon what it goes along with and what it reflects. <laughs> Did O.J. Simpson get away with murder? No, I looked at all the evidence they had and talked to the experts. They never should have brought the charge against him. 
and four of the chief detectives that were involved in that OJ case wound up doing time in California for planning evidence. And as a matter of fact, if you saw the entire trial, there are several instances where evidence was planted and it's recorded on tape. The main reason the American public thinks she got away with something is because there was a sleaze known as Nancy Grace who's still around, and that was her first reporting thing. And she hyped that and put a lot of falsity out there, and the American public believed it because that was the only person they were here. True I fo- saw the entirety of the evidence. Nicole and Rod Goldman got their throat slit from ear to ear their tongues pulled out of the slit with a pair of pliers. The fatal injury was a stab by a left-handed person. O.J. was right-handed. What? Uh- it went in, and it did that damage. There were no peripheral strikes. The footprints in the blood showed that somebody with a size nine shoe, nine and a half shoe, and somebody with a size nine, and somebody with a ten and a half were there on the scene and did it. One of my late brothers actually was the expert the state was going to call until he refuted it. The glove man I know personally, the name is Richard Zuckerwar. He took a tracing of everybody's hand. It was a size large glove that fit Furman. And OJ had a 2XL, which was way too big. Johnny Cochran knew that. So if it does not fit, you must acquit. And you can see Furman actually plant the bloody socks on a video that the jury saw that Nancy Grace refused to talk about. The DNA evidence that condemned them, she said, if you saw what went on, and I recorded all of it and looked at it, the experts said, this doesn't exclude 96,000 people in the L.A. area. And the person that donated this is from the Northeast Mediterranean or amazing. from Sicily. I got them, got, that's uh, amazing information. Yeah, well, I, mean, I don't know. Uh, I don't doubt you. I don't know if all this is true. But okay. if it's, yeah, but anyway. If it's true, it, it's it amazing. Uh, true okay. or false, abortion is worse than slavery. I'd say false. Mexican food. Uh, I'm, a, I'm an abortionist. I do postnatal abortions. <laughs> I sign death orders when people got convicted of first-degree murder and the death penalty it will being the sentence. That's called post-natal abortion. That's the <laughs> drive-by. That's the drug OD. Yeah. So, you know. Um, uh, do we need more white babies? That depends on what side of the equation you happen to be on and what you call white. The typical American white person has about 25 to 27 percent recent African genes in them, and they (laughs) ain't, by their definition, white folk. Do you love white people? I love all people if they act okay. How about white people? Do you love white people? No more than black people. I don't hate them. I don't particularly like them either. I mean, it's neutral. What is this guy doing? And do you love white people? No, not any more than anybody else. <laughs> has anyone ever told you, I mean, has anyone ever told Hoppo to beat you? The what? You told Hoppo to beat me. You remember uh, Oprah show, uh, Color Purple? I don't watch Oprah. I <laughs> met her years and years ago when she used to work for somebody I dated. Oh. And we all were in the same CBS unit under a guy named Roger King. It was me, Judy, Oprah, and Phil. I beat Oprah and Phil in the ratings every week for several years toward the end there. So I don't buy into what she's doing because I know what Roger King was trying to do, and he told me. Amazing. Um, what is love? What say? What is love? Depends upon whether you're talking about uh, agape, which is uh, friends, uh, or you're talking about amor or eros, where it is that thing that leads to why we have a new generation that comes about. (laughs) 
hole. True or false? It, it depends on how you define it. True Brotherly or false? Love, real man made boys right first. What say? True or false? Real man made boys first. Real men did what first? Real men make boys first before girls. Actually, no, because biologically, there are more females born than boys or males. And the other thing is, is when the environment gets very stressful biologically, the male fetuses tend to self-abort more frequently than females. So in a high stress situation, you tend to have more females produced. I imagine the biological utility is that a few males, if they have a lot of females, can ramp up the population again. Is Joe Biden the worst president you've ever seen? Not quite, but close to it. I'd say he's tied for last place in my mind. Um, I would say he has a much better image, but for effectiveness and doing wrong, I'd say he's right there with Ronald Reagan. And for other doing wrong, I would say Barack Obama is close into that bottom <laughs> because Barack Obama is not what most people think he is. And I'll ask you a question. Who is the richest person to ever sit in the White House? Barack it's Obama. Not Donald. Yeah. Really? Because... Yeah, his adopted father, Lolo Sotoro, ran death squads for the Indonesian government. He was wanted by The Hague for being responsible for the murder of millions of, well, not millions, but tens of thousands of Indonesians. He ran the spy ring for the U.S. government through Obama's grandmother in China, North Korea, North Vietnam, remember the Vietnam was going on then, Cambodia and Laos. He was international vice president of Standard Oil at the times. They were trying to get into Indonesia and he was hooked up with the Bushes and he wound up marrying a relative of the Bushes, Obama's mother. Obama's maternal grandfather was George Herbert Walker Bush's first cousin. So uh, it's it's really incestuous in there. And the guy uh, was a, that was the ancestor of the Bushes and Obama and Dick Cheney, they were all cousins, is an interesting person who sold himself into slavery as an indentured slave to get away from Catholic persecution in France to get to America. So Sam Hinckley is his name. So this guy had seven U.S. presidents, one vice president, quite a few billionaires, including Warren Buffett, Pack, or Brad Pitt are all his descendants. So Where are you all getting related. all this information? I never heard at all. Where do you get all this from? Oh, it used to be out there. You can do research. Just be careful. Like, don't always rely on Wikipedia, for example. You see that little pencil that's either at the top or bottom? Click on it, and you put your email in there, and you can modify what Wikipedia is going to say online. So you can put anything in there you want to. And if somebody doesn't convert it back, that's what people will get. So don't believe everything you have online, but it used to be out there until they decided to take it down. Wow. Because of time, I, I just got to move on. Does a chicken have lips? What? Does a chicken Does have it? lips? No, it's got a beak. <laughs> have you ever seen a ghost? No. Should we? But get I have seen some weird stuff standing in broad daylight with my bodyguard. We were looking at a dining room table at a house I had, a big mansion. And as we looked at it, one glass of wine shattered. And we said, whoop, in the world. And then another one shattered. And then we found out that the 
person that was leasing the house, his wife was a witch, and she had <laughs> all of these talisman around the house. And Robert Wagner was a neighbor, and he's the one where his wife supposedly drowned out in Catalina. Oh, yeah, so I remember that. It was real spooky in the neighborhood. <laughs> Other than that, I don't know. Amazing. Should, blacks, should, should we give blacks reparations? It would be nice, but it's like winning the lottery. I'd love to win the big lottery, but I don't guide my life around winning it. And the point is we'd have to have an Enablement and Appropriations Act essentially by U.S. Congress for it to happen. And I don't think that's going to be. Did you have fun? Today? Yes. Okay, yeah. I, I like <laughs> this kind of stuff back and forth. This is my <laughs> amusement instead of Watching basketball, I like to do this kind of thing. Yes. I know you read it from there. Short story. Tell the folks why and how can they help. Well, right now, I've been brokering public peace with the street gangs and the OGs. They're tired of the killing. They want some peace because they live where all of this stuff is going on and they don't like it. Next thing, I've been working with some scientists with NASA and some other engineers and others, and we have a way of using modular hydroelectric generators to generate free energy out of the Mississippi River that won't have an environmental impact that's negative, that will promote an excess of electricity here. We have Ford Motor Company and uh, Cadillac that want to make electric cars in less than 10 years. That's all that will be able to be sold in a lot of states in America and around the world. We can make this to Detroit. We can bring in a new industry that will be based on this electric energy available. We are the distribution center for North America, and we can use the barge traffic that would be generated in Europe and in Asia where they're trying to get in here directly by loading up barges there, putting them on transports, getting them across the Atlantic and getting them to Memphis and then back out. And these guys don't think about it because it is the most corrupt city in the United States. Yeah. And most of the people that are corrupt are not gangsters. They can't go out in the streets because they're afraid of the streets. Also taking control of the police department and putting it under civilian management like the U.S. Department of Defense is, doing some innovative things like I did long time ago that still work in terms of reducing crime. The statewide recidivism rate for Tennessee was about 80% over a 10-year period where they did a study. But in my courtroom, I dropped it down to 18%. And you cannot walk down a street in Memphis with me without somebody walking up to thank me for saving them 20 years ago, 25 years ago, 30 years ago. And they are gray-haired with grandchildren now. So. Amazing. So how can people support you, your website or your website is JJB, Judge Joe Brown, 2023. And the slogan is, is Judge Joe Brown in 2023, send Brown downtown, take back your town. So it's a change. <laughs> nice. JJB in 2023. <laughs> And it repeated it at Sin Brown downtown, take back your town. You know, so uh, I've got a long track record of doing stuff for this community. Yeah. And the rest of them are basically nobodies. And with one or two exceptions, most of them are crooks. <laughs> they steal. And they're going to go to a penitentiary soon enough. Amazing. Well, I really wish you well with that. Memphis need a good mayor. And I, it's, I believe you're the man for that. <clears throat> so I really wish you well. And thank you so much for coming on. I appreciate it. It was amazing. All right. <laughs> and don't forget, folks, that the Father's Day is now on Locals.com. Click the link in the video description to support our work. Don't forget to like, follow, subscribe, telephone, telegraph, tell a woman about the show. It's amazing. Thank you all and for tuning my motto 
protecting womanhood and promoting manhood. That's and right. Even though some don't like it, I think that's important. One hundred percent. One hundred percent. And again, thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate it. Thank you, sir. It's a good interview. Thank One you. of the better said. <laughs> right on. Take care now. All right. I'm out of here.